What are these Freemasons doing? They're doing exactly the same thing. They're worshiping Jehovah, Baal, and the God of all. So it's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's not any of this. So if you claim to be a Christian and, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, then you've got the name that is above every name. And you don't need any of these others. And you need to renounce it. As I wept before God whenever he showed me what I was involved in, and he let me know that it was satanic. Now, you can tear your clothes and throw dirt in the air if you want to, but I can prove that it's satanic, it's demonic. I literally fell on the floor and began to weep and beg him to forgive me for getting involved in this. And, and as, as I was there weeping before him, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, you renounce it, and and in the name of Jesus, and, and, and just, you know, get away with it, get away from it. Uh, so that's what I did. I renounced it in the name of Jesus Christ, and, 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 and God began to open doors for me from that day on because I did what he said to do, and I began to open things up. Acts 4, 2, I'm just going to give you some scriptures. Acts 4 and 12, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He is the light, and he is the life, and the life. Why would you look anywhere else? Why would you? If, I mean, if you're a Christian, you've got the light and the life, who is Jesus Christ. Uh, again, the secrets of Freemasonry, what does the Bible say? Uh, Isaiah 45, 19. God spoke and said, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. So God's not, he, he's, he's, God is about bringing things to light. Men love to cover things up. God will bring it to light. Uh, there's a lot of other verses of Scripture. Just going to touch some again in, in John, St. John's Gospel, the 18th chapter and the 20th verse. Jesus answered him. Now, Jesus is at, before the Sanhedrin, and he's on trial, and he's going to be crucified. And he's the religious leaders. Jesus answered him. And I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temples where the Jews always resort. And I have said nothing in secret. So you guys that believe that Jesus and his disciples had their secret meetings and are part of Freemasonry, that's not what the Bible says. And if you believe that above what Jesus said, then I got a problem with you being a Christian. So you need to hear what he's saying. And like I said, this means something to me that it may not mean to anybody else. And I know that most people that are watching this, if they don't know anything about Freemasonry, then a lot of it may not make sense to them. But I can tell you, Jesus had a reason for saying everything he said. And he said, I have said nothing in secret. And he's saying that to you guys that are doing your secret thing in your secret rooms. All right, Matthew 13, 33, an interesting verse. Matthew 13, 33, and it's interesting that 13, 33 is two powerful numbers in the occult world. Jesus spoke another parable, and this is the 13th chapter is about the parables of the kingdom of heaven. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal until the whole was leavened. The question, the lodge is the widow. I was a widow's son referred to as a widow's son, as a Freemason. Is this the woman? I'm asking the question. Some Freemasons say that Jesus was one of them, but we've already talked about that. We know that he said, I didn't do anything in secret. I didn't speak anything in secret. But we, as we go into this, we're going to see the leaven has come into the church. And uh, it's, we, the lump is just about leaven. It's just about completely leavened because this is what's happening. We're living in that time at the end of this church age. As Brother Swagger done an excellent job yesterday morning preaching about the end of this age. Uh, and man will not endure sound doctrine. They, they, they have, we have come to that place to where they will not endure sound doctrine. Again, Luke 11.33. Listen to what Jesus said. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is single, the whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is evil, the body is full of darkness. And then he said, 1135, Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in you is not darkness. And I'm telling you, when you join the lodge and you walk through those doors and you're hoodwinked, you're blindfolded, 
and they they if you get if you if this spirit grips you when you remove that blindfold you're still hoodwinked spiritually speaking and I'm telling you, Jesus knew what he was talking about. And, of course, this means things to me that it doesn't mean to you because I've been there. I've been hoodwinked, and I've been blinded by this so-called light that I found out was not light at all. It was darkness, and it is darkness. Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Again, we're taking death oaths that we will be, allow our throat to be cut from ear to ear, our heart torn out, our bowels go, uh, cut open. Uh, these death oaths, he says, whenever they do this to you, and, and it, listen, there's nothing, there's no way that it cannot affect you. There's not any way that it can't affect you, because I can prove it, because I was one, I know. So, but he says, don't fear them. This man that was fearful to say right. the word, right. even after he'd come out. I mean, that, that blows my mind, that a man would, would be fearful of saying that word that he claims that God has, has delivered him. That's scary to me. So don't, don't fear these, these people that says they can kill your body. You to fear, you have, he should be fearing God that says, I can destroy both body and soul in hell. Moving on, Luke 12, 3. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness, listen to this, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and I know you say that's going to be out of the future. Listen, that's right now. You're doing this in the darkness. You're doing this in the room. You're doing this in behind closed doors. You've got the, the, the lodge sealed with the tile or no cowans or eavesdroppers, and you're in, you're in darkness. He said, therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear. Listen, the secret word of a master mason is to be said at low breath on the five points of fellowship in the ear. That's why nobody would say it out loud, because we've been commanded not to. So this is what you, don't tell me that Jesus didn't know what you guys were going to do. He's God. He knew exactly what you were going to do in your secret rooms, in your secret orders. What's spoken in the ear, whispered in the ear, he said, in closets, uh, and, and it, could be, it could have been an inner chamber shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. Jesus is saying, what I'm telling you, he's talking to his disciples, what I'm telling you, and when we were having our meetings, you can shout it from the housetop. You don't have to be under the fear of saying something that's, that's, uh, that's wrong. Uh, Ephesians 5, 11, and 12, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. Listen, and we don't have time to get into everything that's going on in these chambers, but there's some, there's some very shameful things that goes on. And the very fact that, that they would threaten you with a death oath is shameful enough. Ephesians 5.13, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. In other words, it brings it out. It don't cover it up. It don't conceal it. It brings it out. It manifests it. And this is what we're talking about. Again, we're going to move on now into when, when free and accepted masonry come into existence. Again, we said this earlier that there was a time for several, a couple of thousand years, maybe even longer, uh, very much longer, really, because it starts, goes back to the garden, but, but where... You could not be a mason unless you was a stone mason. You had to be a part of the stone cutters, the hewers, and the placers, and the etchers in stone. But in the year of 1722, and some will vary different dates, but it won't vary very much, uh, the masons became known as free and accepted masons. You will see this on their, on their advertisements at the lodge. It will be F and AM, free and accepted masons. You no longer had to be of the craft, which was a stone mason. But you can still be a witch of the witchcraft and be a and be a Freemason. This opened the door for many powerful and corrupt men to come into the craft, and the New World Order had another player, which I believe was started by the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits to work for the Vatican in the Protestant community. And we have more proof that, that we can that we can use to back that up. We're going to show the first. Uh, clip. If you want to get a shot of this book, this is Masonry Beyond the Light, 
uh, I use this, I bought this, uh, I use it a lot, I recommend it to people that's interested in finding out about Freemasonry. The man that, that wrote it, his name is William Schneblin, uh, and we're going to find out some interesting things about him. But in this book is, is everything that you need. There's a whole chapter dealing with the Eastern Star. Uh, he does lots of videos, uh, but this is an older one that he done quite a few years ago. It's actually on the Internet. If you would like to go to the Internet and, and, and type up uh, William Schneblin or Schneblin, uh, exposing the Illuminati from within. It's over. It's over two hours long, but it's very interesting and very informative. So let's see the sound bite. I wanted to get into the ministry, which in my case was through the uh, Roman Catholic Church. That's what I was raised in, and I knew very little about the Bible, and I wanted to be a priest. When I got to college, however, I had my plan somewhat derailed by two forces that were very strong at that time. This was the time of the Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council, when a lot of ferment was taking place in the Catholic Church. A lot of my professors were telling me that the Bible wasn't really true, what little I knew about the Bible was false, that Moses didn't really part the Red Sea, that uh, Adam and Eve never really existed, that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. What did that leave me? You know, Here I was going to be a priest, and I didn't know what to believe in. The other thing that happened to convergent forces is I had some professors that today would have been called New Agers. Back then, the word wasn't even heard of. And they played on a doctrine that's part of Catholic theology. And this doctrine is the idea that the priest is another Christ. And when you go up on the altar and you confect the sacrament of the Eucharist, as it's called, which means you turn the bread and wine literally into the body and blood of Jesus, you are acting literally as another Christ. And they told me, these, these particular professors, if I wanted to do that, if I wanted to be another Christ, I had to do the same things that Jesus did to attain that exalted state. See, they did not believe that Jesus was God Almighty. They believed he was a kind of ascended master, and that he had learned how to do all of these things by going and studying under gurus in the Far East and studying under the Magi of Egypt. And some of you may have heard about this, either from bookstores or TV shows, The Lost Years of Jesus. Now, here I was. I was 18, 19 years old. I was being told this stuff by people who had PhDs, THDs, DDs, you know, all that stuff behind their name, you know, Roman collars on. What was I supposed to think? So I believed in them. I began studying the occult because I thought this was the way that I would become more Christ-like. All right, here's what I don't know, Jim. When they work, walk through that door to join... Take them, do you have a section where you take them through the different steps that they have to become a Freemason? We're going to, we're going to show them. We're going to show one coming through the door. To okay, the that's what I want. And, and because we, we've been sharing all these wonderful verses of Scripture about why it's wrong. But what is it? Yeah, we need to show what's wrong. We're going to show them uh, the candidate kneeling at the altar to the worshipful master. Yeah. Okay, that's what, yeah. You know, like if I'm walking, and I'm going to ask you that question, okay. we'll be right back. 